which only 10% of meeting rooms have. Said that it would lay off as many as 6,000 employees over the next. Any chance that scenario could play out? Once upon a time, Steve Jobs himself looked up to HP. But today, no one is even looking at HP. The search interest surrounding the company has fallen by over 60% throughout the past 20 years, and the situation at the company is only worse. HP has been embroiled in multiple lawsuits regarding missed payments, bribery, and breaches of contract. They tried to expand out of their main business and enter the rapidly growing enterprise software industry, only to massively overpay for an acquisition and end up writing off $8.8 billion. Pretty soon, HP had to shift their focus from trying to expand into new industries to just trying to survive. They would split up HP into two different companies, a personal computer business and a printer business, but this niche down focus didn't help much. HP would be forced to do layoffs left, right, up, and down, eliminating thousands of jobs with each and every cut. Back in 2010, HP had as many as 350,000 employees, but by 2021, this number would decrease to 51,000 in the original company and 60,000 in the spin off. In other words, HP has shed nearly a quarter million employees. You would think that this massive cut in headcount would strengthen HP's financials, but in reality, they've only been getting weaker and weaker. Things have gotten so bad that both companies have a non-negligible chance of going bankrupt. HP Inc. currently has a bankruptcy probability of 38%, and HP Enterprise has a bankruptcy probability of 44%. For perspective, strong companies like Apple tend to have bankruptcy probabilities in the low single digits. So HP is definitely on their last legs today, but it wasn't always like this. For over half a century, HP was an electronics juggernaut and virtually everyone knew the iconic logo. HP wasn't just popular amongst the public either. They were and still are absolute legends in Silicon Valley having been one of the first tech companies to be founded in the valley. So here's the story of how HP went from being the father of Silicon Valley to being consumed by the same companies that they had inspired. Taking a look back, the story of HP dates back over 100 years to a man named William Reddington Hewlett or Bill Hewlett. Bill was born on May 20th, 1913, right before the start of World War I. But fortunately, Bill's family wouldn't be affected too much by the war, as his father was a respected medical professor at the University of Michigan. In fact, his father would actually get a promotion during the war to Stanford University, resulting in the family relocating to modern-day Silicon Valley. Unlike many Silicon Valley founders today, Bill would end up following in his father's academic footsteps and become a highly educated man. First, he would attend Stanford University, where he received a bachelor's in engineering in 1934. He would follow this up with a master's in electrical engineering from MIT in 1936 before returning to Stanford to get a post-master's electrical engineering degree in 1939. Little to say, Bill spent most of his 20s at college. This first-class education not only gave Bill a strong understanding of engineering, but it also led him to crossing paths with his future lifelong friend, David Packard. Like Bill, David was born on the onset of World War I on September 7, 1912 in Pueblo, Colorado. David also came from a well-off family as his father was a respected attorney. But unlike Bill, David wasn't as drawn towards engineering from a young age. Rather, one of his biggest passions was sports and he would spend much of his undergraduate years at Stanford playing basketball and football. But he didn't pursue these interests after college, and he would settle for something much less daring, a job at General Electric in New York. He didn't stay here for long though, as he would return to Stanford to get a master's in electrical engineering. Little did he know, this educational trip would end up becoming a permanent stay. You see, David and Bill would start working on small electronics projects in a rented garage using $538. They built things like frequency oscillators, distortion analyzers, and audio signal generators. About a year after they started working on these side projects, 
Bill and David would decide to make the partnership official. Fun fact, the name of this new company was decided by a coin flip. If David had won the coin flip, the company's name would have been PH. And it's probably a good thing that Bill won, as PH would have given a lot of people nightmares about high school chemistry. Now that HP was official, Bill and David had to focus on projects that were actually commercially viable, which led them to audio oscillators. One of the biggest shortfalls of 1930s oscillators was that they weren't all that stable. Bill and David would fix this shortfall by incorporating an incandescent light bulb into their oscillator, which acted as a resistor, stabilizing the output. HP would dub this product the 200A, and not only was it more stable than the competition, but it was way cheaper, coming in at $89.40. Most of the oscillators on the market were selling for well over $200. This value quickly caught the attention of Bud Hawkins, who was the chief sound engineer at Walt Disney Studios. Bud would agree to buy eight of these oscillators for Disney's upcoming film, Fantasia, and this would go down as HP's first major order. It was by no means their last though. By the end of their first year in business, HP would end up pulling $5,369 worth of revenue and $1,563 worth of profit. This is the same as $115,000 worth of revenue and $33,000 worth of profit today. And with that, HP was in business. Moving into the 1940s, HP would start producing equipment for the war, and this would prove to be extremely lucrative. They continued selling their classic products like wave analyzers and audio signal generators. But they would also produce a few war-specific products like counter-radar technology and artillery shell proximity fuses. By the end of the war, HP would employ 200 people, and the company was large enough to be incorporated as a full-on company, as opposed to just a partnership. Business was booming, and sales would reach $5.5 million by 1951, the same as $63 million today. And the funny part was that HP had yet to even enter any of the businesses that they're known for today. But this would all change due to eight individuals. At the time, semiconductors weren't an actual business concept. It was just something that engineering professors and PhD students dabbled with. Such was the case with Professor William Shockley and eight of his PhD graduates. Truth be told, these eight graduates hated Professor Shockley, and in 1957, they would make the bold decision to ditch Shockley and create their own company, Fairchild Semiconductor. These eight are now known as the Traitorous Eight, and they're basically the pioneers of the semiconductor industry. They would end up creating dozens of smaller chip companies from Fairchild, including both Intel and AMD. HP was watching all of this unfold firsthand, and they wanted a piece of the action, so they would begin investing heavily into semiconductors themselves throughout the 1960s. They partnered with Sony and Yokogawa Electric, but this actually turned out to be a big mistake. It turned out that outsourcing chips to Japan was actually more expensive than producing in America. This blunder consistently made them one step behind Fairchild and eventually Intel, but HP continued persisting, and they would eventually enter the computing space in 1966 with the HP 2100 and the HP 1000. These were mini computers that were primarily used for business applications, and HP would find quite a bit of success in this area. But for some reason, they didn't want to expand from outside this area. In fact, they didn't even want to expand to the personal computer space, and this wasn't just an oversight. They were consciously avoiding the PC space. Steve Wozniak was actually an HP employee at the time, and he pitched the PC idea to HP on five different occasions. It wasn't until he was turned down all five times that he would finally agree to start Apple with Steve Jobs. And it's truly quite a shame that HP turned down Wozniak, but then again, we wouldn't have Apple if it wasn't further stubbornness. Ironically though, HP would eventually end up entering the PC space themselves in 1980 with the HP 85, which was designed to be a direct competitor to IBM. A couple of years later, HP would introduce a lineup of inkjet and laser printers along with a lineup of scanners as well. And this leads us to the HP that we're all familiar with today. But unlike today, HP wasn't doing bad, 
In fact, they were killing it. They would register the domain hp.com in 1986, which was the ninth domain to ever be registered. And one year later, the garage that Bill and David used to start HP would be officially designated as a historical landmark. Moving into the 1990s, HP would make acquisitions left and right, become a household computer brand, and grow to be one of the largest companies in the world, period. So, what happened? HP's downfall can't be explained by any singular reason. Rather, it was just accumulation of several smaller factors and trends, starting with the commoditization of PCs. Back in the day, the brand of a computer carried significant weight. People wanted a Dell or an HP or an Apple. But the only company that has been able to hold on to this differentiation is Apple. Nowadays, you go Apple or you go Windows. If you go Windows, much of your purchasing decision is just based on which company is offering the best value at the time, as opposed to the brand. So HP didn't have a very good shot in the face of lower cost alternatives from companies like Acer. Nonetheless, HP tried to compete, which led to their profit margins being whittled down to the low single digit figures. Dell also faced a similar crisis, but they addressed the situation in a completely different manner. Michael Dell came out of retirement, took the company public, and they basically quit the consumer space. They pulled a Microsoft and switched over to offering infrastructure solutions and cloud computing, and these are the sectors that are really driving Dell today. Their consumer business is more for brand recognition purposes than actually making money. HP, on the other hand, continued pursuing the PC and printer space year after year. HP did try to enter the cloud space themselves, but no serious company would even consider them as a solution. HP also flirted with the idea of entering the mobile space. In July of 2011, HP launched their touchpad, but this was such a massive flop that they would discontinue their product less than two months later. I don't think you'd be surprised to hear that HP didn't look back at the mobile space. But likely their biggest blunder was their attempt to take over Autonomy Corporation. Autonomy was an enterprise software company, and HP hoped that this is exactly what they needed to break into the enterprise market. They spent $10.3 billion to buy a majority stake in the company, but truth be told, the HP brand just dragged down Autonomy. And HP would end up writing off Autonomy as an $8.8 .8 billion loss not long after. At this point, HP's core business was declining, and all of their new endeavors were not only failing, but burning massive amounts of money. So HP had no choice but to pivot from trying to pivot to just trying to survive. This led to loads of layoffs, spinning off various businesses, and even splitting the company, leading us to where we are today. On the surface, it looks like HP put a lot of effort into trying to pivot. But the truth is that all of their efforts were just band-aids for the underlying fundamental problem, which was that the American tech industry had moved away from hardware. The new industries were data collection, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mobile development, and the internet. There's a reason that Google sells all of their hardware for no profit or for a loss. The money is not in the hardware, it's in the software. This is true for even Apple, and that's why they've been placing such a large emphasis on their services. Meanwhile, HP has been beating a dead horse for decades now, and it's been consistently looking worse and worse for them. This isn't to say that they're gonna go bankrupt tomorrow, but at this point, their future isn't looking too bright unless they have a true revolution. And that's how HP became irrelevant. Do you think HP could have played their cards better? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you hope that HP rests in peace. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hori, and I'll see you guys on the next one.